Welcome. I've been reacting to the Outlander TV series, and I'm also reading the books for the first time. I just finished book two, Dragonfly and Amber. My overall impression of book two is that there's an incredibly compelling narrative sandwiched at the beginning and the end of book two, but in between, quite frankly, it kind of dragged a bit, which is partly why it took so long to finish. Sorry about that. Full disclosure, I kept pausing to read other things like the entire Descendants books, Treasure Island, and uh, all of Plato. Plato was more engaging than the middle of book two. That being said, I absolutely loved the Roger POV chapters. I wish the whole book had been from his perspective. After my grandparents passed, they hadn't really downsized much, so I really connected to his having to go through boxes and boxes of things because I'm like, yeah, I've been there. And it's even worse because you're also dealing with grief at the time. So it's like this massive project plus you're not feeling yourself. Anyone who has gone through that, you know what I mean. I also have a bit of a crush on Brianna. So hearing Roger talk about her as a flaming goddess, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm right there with you, Roger. The scene where Brianna has single malt for the first time <laughs> was so funny. Ant spray? Ouch! So I was just in shock. And then her reaction to him was also pretty adorable. He's got the grooviest eyes. What a compliment. I'm so bad at flirting that I swear the next time I find someone attractive, I'm going to be like, um, you have the grooviest eyes. <laughs> I think my favorite part from the beginning was when they end up at Blackjack's grave and Claire sees the date and she's like, I told you, I told you. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I preferred how Brianna found out. Claire completely loses it with grief when she finds Jamie's gravestone saying, beloved husband of Claire. I'm not exactly sure what they were trying to do in the adaptation there, skipping that scene in the cemetery. Now, I'm also very biased because I love cemeteries, as anyone on my other channel knows. But I feel like it would have been a more interesting scene visually as well to have it. I did agree with the reordering. The Frank part, the main section, and then all of the Roger stuff at the end. I feel like that flowed more naturally on the show. And I'm kind of wondering if one of the reasons I didn't like book two as much is because I got so entranced with the Roger part at the beginning that I was frustrated by being, you know, yanked away from that. And I think if we had started with Claire and Jamie and then transitioned and done all the Roger stuff at the end of the book, I would have been like, this book is amazing. After leaving Roger, there were some things I liked. Claire talks about having hardly any clothes and she's having to constantly mend them all the time. Unlike her magical, never-ending wardrobe from the show that always leaves me going, where did she get that? It was a cute scene when she teaches Jamie the Air Force exercises for strengthening his back. I really like it when they do crossover timey wiminess. And two minutes later, the book really upset me because it has a completely nonsensical portrayal of stays. Again. Even if Claire was tight-lacing, which people rarely did, by the way, she would not be gasping and wheezing like this. Authors. Once I got over it, though, the costume department did do a good job in France. I always appreciate it when it's clear that the costumer read the book. Yay! <laughs> Sometimes you're like, did you do any research? Claire's infamous anti-shoe attitude continues. She wandered off alone in Versailles to take off her shoes, which caused the entire incident. You know, this is turning into one of my favorite running bits. She makes me laugh every time. In fact, she makes a lot of jokes in the books. For example, Jamie gets in trouble again, and she's like, go directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. And Jamie goes, when you start to talk daft, I know you're all right. It's one of the best parts. She's so funny. I think the main reason that the Paris section especially kind of dragged for me was because a lot of the incidents were meant to be shocking to a modern audience. 
But uh, unfortunately, I've studied Parisian and Versailles culture from the time period back when I was a teenager, and I still remember a lot of it. So I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it seems typical. Hey, you know, I haven't reread the entire Narnia series in a while. Introducing Alex Randall was so much more dramatic. They thought he was Jack. Jamie almost killed him and Claire passed out from shock. It was an interesting choice to change it into kind of just a tense scene between Alex and Claire. There was also a super cinematic moment where one of Frank's lectures turns into this terrifying nightmare. Like, oh, I was reading it and going, wow, that, oh, that's quite the dream, Claire. I enjoyed the book version of Claire's first visit to the hospital way more. There were all those ladies who just freaked out and left. They couldn't handle it. And eventually only Mary stayed. She was a bit green around the gills, but still there. It would have been fun to watch that on screen. The scene where Jamie meets Bouton is so funny. <laughs> I loved it. And you saw a lot more of Jamie and Claire's relationship too in a really cheeky way. Like he snuck up and pulled her garter down one time, not in public, but it was just like a cute moment between them. Speaking of better in the book, how Jamie met Fergus. Sailors were hunting him down, so he snuck off to buy a huge sausage and he uses that to fight them off and then ends up in the brothel where he runs into Fergus. I would have loved to see that scene on film. I mean, especially the part where Claire is just like, I'm sorry, you expect me to believe that story? And he pulls out the sausage in question is like, here, we can eat it. <laughs> I was dying. They were also way more intelligent. I recall from my reactions, I was always going, why are you talking in front of servants? Here in the book, they're very careful not to do that. In fact, they suspect some of them might even be kind of spying for the other side. So they're very, very careful. One thing that I think the adaptation did do well is combining a lot of characters and scenes from the whole Paris section <laughs> to shorten it. Although unfortunately that also meant cutting some of the Master Raymond stuff that I found really fascinating. All his secret drawers and moments with Claire. All right, the 69 conversation also happened in the book and she didn't explain what it was. Fortunately, somebody very kindly told me what that meant in the comments section. Cause I was like, I don't know if I wanna Google that. But I was really expecting Diana to spell it out for us, you know, help the audience here. No, she just assumes you know what it is. Well, we don't, Diana. We don't. The infamous dinner party scene where Mary completely and understandably loses it. Jamie went to help her by jumping on a table and up the banister in this like acrobatic feat. He rolled a 20 on acrobatics for that one. I think I reread it several times to watch it. Just in case you missed my other book video, I should probably explain about that. I read books like movies, so I see everything in full color. And because I came at Outlander via the TV show, I haven't cast anyone in my own head other than someone who doesn't appear on the show. I see the cast often in different outfits. Like I think Charles is described as wearing plum velvet in one scene. So I redressed him in my head. And sometimes they're doing different things, but it's definitely the actors on the show that I see. It was Sam who jumped up on the table and did, in my brain, an actual flip and then landed on the stairs. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. I mean, not for Mary. Poor Mary. But Jamie? The whole La Dame Blanche history was also really intriguing. How Saint Germain started the rumor out of spite, and then Jamie kind of picked it up. And then Master Raymond was like, yeah? Is she a sorceress? Hmm? Yeah, well, I mean, she comes here and she talks to me and I'm a sorcerer, so. And as a result, this rumor kind of turned into this incredible story that she's this powerful sorceress. So it's no wonder that it terrified people very helpfully. Thank you again, Master Raymond. All right, Jack Randall's appearance was also part of one of Claire's infamous shoe incidents. She was sprinting after Mary and had taken them off yet again, <laughs> when she ran into Jack. 
like literally ran into him. It was both shocking and absolutely hilarious because Jack thought she was dead from the wolves and she thought he was dead. And so they started doing the Spider-Man pointing meme, basically going, I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. I can see why they changed it, but I kind of love that moment because it's really darkly comedic. I like that the Fa Pox storyline from the book was streamlined for the show because I got a bit confused. I was like, wait, who's going where, when, and doing what? Master Raymond's hands glow blue with magic in the books. I am still convinced that someday Claire as a healer will be able to tap into that as well. Like we're going to get a scene in a future book where her hands start glowing blue and she'll be like, <gasps> my favorite characters so far in all of Outlander that I'm aware of are Dougal, Roger, and Master Raymond. Speaking of the miscarriage, I got confused again at this point. It was basically all cut out. And Claire was sort of wandering around, shoving maidservants in closets. And there was a random storyline with a priest for inexplicable reasons. We never really felt what she went through. I think it was because she herself was very detached. And it is from her headspace, as it were. And finally, when she meets Jamie and discusses it, some of the feelings come out. But uh, it just felt very disjointed. And unresolved. It was uncomfortably odd as a reader to go through that section. The show took that tangled mess of a storyline and reforged it into what I think is one of the best episodes in all of Outlander Faith. It is absolutely powerful. It moves me every time. And it's probably one of the ones I've gone on back the most often to rewatch. When I think, what episode of Outlander do I want to see that has the best performances, the best story? I always head for season two, and I click play on Faith. There's a moment when Jamie and Claire are in a cavern, and they find two skeletons. Now, maybe it's just a symbol of eternal love that wasn't meant to be important, but I also know Diana and her attention to detail, and I feel like six books from now she might go, Remember those two seemingly random skeletons they found in a cavern? Do I have some reveals for you? So I just wrote a note in case that happens, so I'll remember it. Since this has turned into less of a book two review and more of a reasons why Master Raymond is awesome, I love that he started a magical box subscription for Claire. Like he's just always sending her these random cool things. Just because she made an impression and he liked her, I think he saw a fellow healer and went, hmm, she's different. Outlander, do you want to make some extra money? Offer us a Master Raymond magical box subscription. Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. Please do that. Speaking of letters, there are also some from Mother Hildegard and Bouton. Actually, you know what, Outlander? Scratch the Master Raymond idea. We need parcels from Paris. It could be anything. Perhaps some brandy, a letter from Boudon, who doesn't want one of those, a magical talisman, or scandalous love poetry. So many breadcrumbs in here for America as well. Some Aunt Jocasta mentions. Skipping back to season one of all things, Remember that wool walking scene that I thought was added out of nowhere, but also super cool? It turns out they plucked it from book two, because we had way longer in Lalibroch. And this is when things really started changing in the TV show. I won't get into it because there are so many changes. You know what they are. We don't need to get into them. I liked Claire's observation about Scotland at the time. You cannot save the world, but you might save the man in front of you. That's such a good attitude to have. When everything seems to go wrong, just concentrate on what you can do, not on what you can't. Okay, somebody needs to start a drinking game for every time Claire takes off her shoes because she's done it like three more times since I last mentioned it. I really enjoyed the demonstration duel between Dougal and Jamie and the description of that. Really fun. There's also a quick moment where Jamie has a deer fly run in and just calmly deals with it. 
I just started laughing because I've done reactions to Men in Kilts over on Patreon. And if you've seen that, you know how Sam feels about stuff like midges. He, he actually ran out of a scene mid-filming. I'll leave you to it. I apologize for my uh, midge-averse friend. So I kept thinking about how Sam would have reacted if he had gotten to film that scene, and I just started cracking up. <laughs> Especially if Graham was in the same scene, and he would be like... I picked out my favorite narration moment to read to you. This, coupled with the imminent prospect of leaving the men in their dark, filthy imprisonment, to go to Sterling and face the humiliation of pleading with Charles, was more than sufficient to explain the look on Jamie's face, that of a man who has just breakfasted on broken glass. Mm-hmm. It's just so good, Claire. <laughs> Broken glass. <laughs> Another amazing quote is from Dougal, when Rupert is telling him not to mourn his passing. I'm your chief, man, he said with a quivering half-smile. You'll not order me. I shall grieve ye and I like. There's a reason. He's one of my favorites. It was interesting to see how the beheading was handled, I sort of loved the moment when Murta just casually pulls out his bag, reveals he has the Duke's head, and everyone was just like, You did what? What a legend. I also enjoyed the continuity of safely getting Mary back to Alex. In the show, she abruptly vanishes, and I kept thinking I had missed an episode or something. Just a really awkward transition between 11 and 12. I remember being like, where is Mary? Is she okay? The book had us covered. It's like, here she is. We're going to put her over here gently. <laughs> She's fine. You can relax as a reader. The moment in the stables near Culloden, when Jamie arrives and finds that the horses have been eaten, that was incredibly moving. It suddenly hits him that everything Claire has been telling him is real and is happening right now. Absolutely heartbreaking scene. And having that right before their discussion about the assassination makes so much more sense. That always felt off to me. Like, where did this come from? But watching Jamie just completely breaking down, feeling helpless and terrified, worried for his men, Leading into that discussion, that I understood. Great writing for the encounter with Dougal, although I felt it was a bit rushed. He only got a page. I would have liked a little bit more description there, but that's okay. I'm a very biased Dougal fan. <laughs> There's a lovely scene at the Stones where Jamie asks her for a wise woman's blessing. The fact that he loves her, but also has incredible respect for her abilities and intelligence is one of the reasons that I ship those two. And such a dramatic exit with Claire running up, throwing herself headfirst at the stones, trying to get away. Ooh. <laughs> Yay! We're back to Roger's POV again. Finally. Brianna really got angry. I mean, she broke a window. There's been a lot of that. Back in France, when Jamie and Claire fought, he broke the window where Aphrodite was, which is super symbolic, but I feel like there's a lot more windows being broken in the books. I guess she didn't have to worry about budget. What a reveal that Claire came to Scotland to find Galus, and she asks Roger for permission because he's the one who's going to be most affected. He might cease to exist. He has to have a say in that. Very interesting. And I think my favorite scene overall was when Claire started to speculate on the technical aspects of time travel. For example, does it matter when you travel? Beltane, Samhain, etc. Galus actually charted Samhain in some of the other key moments, just like I was in the very beginning going, hmm, hmm, I think probably the time of year has to do with it. She also chose the most powerful moon phase, the new moon, to try and travel. At least that's what it seemed like from the book because there's no moon going on in the scene. It specifically mentions that. 
so much fiction, they just go witchy stuff. Full moon. No. Really interesting way to end the book as well, with Galus sacrificing her husband and jumping through the stones like that. Which really leads us into book three. What I found surprising is that Roger almost got dragged in. Like, he didn't just hear the buzzing, like, on the show. He was getting, like, sucked into the vortex of the stones or whatever's going on over there. And Brianna drags him back and basically saves him from going back in time with his mother. That would have been awkward. Also, you know in my reactions how I'm always like, why didn't they bring a duffel bag with them through the stones once they knew that's what they were for? Galus, you're my hero. In this moment, not for the other things. Because she had a huge knapsack with her. It mentions it actually hitting her as she ran through the stones. And I'm like, yes. Preparedness. In conclusion, I didn't find it as compelling as book one, but I absolutely adored all the Roger stuff. And there were a few scattered moments in the rest of it that I liked. But honestly, it felt a little bit like panning for gold where you're just going through all this random stuff and occasionally you find a gold flake and you're like, ooh, that's cool. And then you keep going and going. And you're like, oh. At the beginning of the book, I think someone probably told me it was from Roger's POV, but I didn't remember. So I may have started jumping up and down screaming when I realized it was Roger who was narrating. <laughs> I knew he was going to appear but I didn't think it was from his POV. That was a really fun moment to find that out. However, I've seen all of the show that's currently been released before really getting to book two. What was it like if you read these not knowing who Roger was and you open up the book and you're like, I can't wait to hear more about Claire and Roger Wakefield? Were you annoyed? Do you think it was interesting? Were you like, Hmm, I'll give this a try and see what happens. I would love to hear what your reaction was when you first opened it up. I will be getting to book three, but next I'll be reading The Exile, which is an Outlander graphic novel, because I think it's Jamie's perspective on book one. So I was like, hmm, I should probably read this earlier on in the timeline. So I'll be doing that next as a video. Thank you for sitting through almost an hour of recording, but I'll probably edit it down. I know that my reactions are probably over by now for the latest season. I will be coming back whenever Outlander comes back, and I will continue to release these book videos as I finish them. If you want a little bit more heads up on when this will happen, check Instagram because I usually post my status updates there.